hey, hey, today is Bat Appreciation Day. And no, I don't mean baseball bats. I mean the flappy, flying around sorts of bats. I did not realize that there was actually an appreciation day for bats. So are you the type of person who's pretty terrified of bats and think that uh, they're just going to simply suck your blood? Or are you like me and realize that most bats are pretty harmless and actually do serve a purpose in our ecosphere? I don't know. I don't know how much you know about bats. But there is one thing that I do know, and that is the Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I am Jeff McAleer. I'm back once again as your host here on The Daily Dope. I also happen to be the grand poobah of the GamingGang.com. So welcome aboard. I've got a pretty big show today, and today is Tuesday, April 17th. Still awfully cold in the Chicago area. I think we're seeing a high in the 40s today, low 40s. So that stinks. Unbelievable. We're, I think we're running about 10 degrees below, 10 to 15 degrees below normal. Mm-hmm. There's still even a little bit of snow sticking on the ground outside. Anyway, as I started to say, I got a big show ahead today. I have uh, quite a bit of news. I've got five news pieces today, so that's pretty cool. Plus, I'm also going to review the... Northern Territory expansion for Grim Slingers from Greenbrier Games. So I will get to that in just a few moments. All right, box, come on. Stay there. There we go. We're good. There is a lot of stuff all over this table next to me. And uh, I'm going to try to do my best not to knock it around because I need it for the review. Anywho, so... Let's get on into the news without any further delay. I do want to point out that um, Plat Hat Games has finally revealed when their Spectre Ops game is coming out. And it is a standalone, uh, I, I don't want to say it's an expansion, I believe it's just a standalone Spectre Ops game that you can actually combine with the original Spectre Ops Shadow of Babel. And I've got the dope. Welcome back, fans of Spectre Ops. Spectre Ops Shadow of Babel, the critically acclaimed stealth action game by Emerson Matsuchi, has a standalone sequel on the horizon. Spectre Ops Broken Covenant is a standalone game set in the Spectre Ops universe that puts two to five players in the middle of a war that's fought in the shadows. Corporate secret, secrets, I should say, linger within the corridors of Raxon's abandoned headquarters, and even though the base is empty, it is not forgotten. In this tense cat and mouse showdown, a lone ARC agent stalks the shadows of the facility, attempting to complete secret objectives while hunters from Raxon's experimental security division, say that five times fast, try to pinpoint their location and destroy them. On one side, the agent must use all their skills and equipment to succeed. On the other, the hunters rely on teamwork and superhuman skills to locate their prey. No matter who you play, you must use strategy, deduction, and stealth to win. Spectre Ops Broken Covenant is for two to five players, ages 14 and up, and will play in about 90 minutes. The game will carry an MSRP of $59.95 when it arrives in early June. Gotta admit, I have not played any Spectre Ops games. In fact, to be completely honest, I don't believe I've ever played a, bla uh, a Plaid Hat game title before. I almost said Blad Hat. The hell was I thinking there? Plaid Hat. But no, I don't think I've ever played one of their games. Ever. I know, pretty bizarre. Yes, I've never played Dead of Winter. Sorry. 
But looks uh, like this could be kind of interesting. I would take a guess. This is one of those games that are going to be much better with a full complement of players, say for an example, five, than as a two player game. All right, moving right along. Aries Games has a release that's coming out soon, which might appeal to some of the war gamers out there because Ares is partnering with Pendragon Games to release some of the latter company's titles in English. And I've got the dope on Waterloo, Enemy Mistakes, Bad Translation and All. Waterloo, Enemy Mistakes is a strategic war game on the last battle of Napoleon, an occasion of the Bicentenary, Bicentenary? I guess maybe that's correct of the Battle of Waterloo, keeping in mind this game originally came out in 2015. The game recreates the clash between the British lineup, helped along by the Prussian army, and the French one. I'm telling you, this translation is terrible. The players identify themselves with the commanders of the armies. With two players, one leads the Duke of Wellington in opposition to Napoleon Bonaparte. To complete the main scenery, there will be, eventually, a third player in representation of the Field Marshal Gebhard Leberecht von Blücher, leader of the Prussian. Yeah, serious. I, that sentence just ends. Leader of the Prussian. Uh-huh. The game uses an overall mechanic of pushing counters over the board without them being placed on specific places in an organized grid. Huh. The game is for two to three players, ages 13 and up, and plays in about 150 minutes. Two and a half hours. There is no MSRP just yet, but Waterloo is set for a June release. All right, so, of course, the translation of the sell sheet info is horrible, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this will be a terrible game. I have to admit, it looks kind of interesting as far as the map that they're showing, because it almost looks as if it has a bit of a Kriegspiel sort of feel to it. I don't know. I have no idea, because you notice there's no hexes. Doesn't look like there's really any sort of um, movement area laid out. Doesn't look like it's point to point either. So this could be fairly unique, and it will be available for the first time in English. Moving right along, Z-Man Games has revealed a new title set in the Age of Discovery, and I've got the dope on Race to the Newfound Land. Yes, Newfound Land, not Newfoundland. Risk life and limb journeying across the vast Atlantic Ocean and discovering new land. In the Age of Discovery, sailors risk life and limb to cross the vast and stormy Atlantic Ocean in search of new territory. Compete to claim the riches of a new land for your country. Sailors dare to take on the ocean, crossing the vast and tempestuous sea to discover new territory. New territories off the coast of North America were discovered. The new found land. Get it? Now the mightiest nations of Western Europe are competing for the riches of this new region, fighting to stake their claim. Build your fleet and sail onward to glory and wealth for your country. Load your ship with supplies and haul them across the treacherous seas. Safe delivery of those supplies will score victory points for each order completed. Choose your ships carefully for these ventures. Faster ships will beat your opponents to the most desirable orders, but larger ships will carry more supplies to fulfill the order. Set aside extra resources to build better ships or upgrade your shipyard. Improve your fleet to get ahead of your opponents, quickly settling on the islands and fulfilling orders. Will you win the race of discovery? Race to the New Found Land is for 2-4 to four players, ages 10 and up, and plays in about 60-90 to 90 minutes. Game will carry an MSRP of $59.95 when it arrives this summer. This looks pretty cool. And for some strange reason, I believe this is originally a Hansen Gluck title. 
So I believe that uh, press release info there may have been a bit of a translation because it did seem kind of a little off. Don't know. But I got to admit, I kind of dig exploration games. And granted, yes, this kind of seems like it might be sort of a pickup and delivery game. I don't know. But the game board looks kind of unique, so this might be something to definitely check out. And it does look like you have a choice of various different nations. So we've got the Netherlands, Spain, uh, I would take a guess like France, maybe England. Those are kind of guesses there. All right, but that is coming in summer, and like I said, it looks like it could be kind of interesting. Another title that I know a lot of people are watching for is coming from WizKids, and they're moving nicely on their revamp of the classic Fury of Dracula. Yes, it is set for a July release, and I've got a little bit of dope. In Fury of Dracula, a game of gothic adventure, the one player takes the role of Dracula, while up to four others attempt to stop him by controlling vampire hunters from the famous Bram Stoker novel. Dracula has returned and is determined to control all of Europe by creating an undead empire of vampires. Dracula uses a deck of location cards to secretly travel through Europe, leaving a trail of encounters and events for the hunters that chase him. Meanwhile, the hunters attempt to track and destroy Dracula using the limited information available to them, a task easier said than done when their prey has the power to change forms into a wolf or bat, and can even melt away into the mist when confronted. To save Europe and rid the world of Dracula's foul plague, the hunters must destroy Dracula before he earns enough victory points to win the game. Will they have enough wit and bravery to defeat the Dark Count? Fury of Dracula is for 2-5 to five players ages 10 and up, and plays in around 2-3 to three hours. This new WizKids edition is going to include a new revised rulebook, larger cards, so gone are the little Fantasy Flight Games cards, so I believe these are going to be poker-sized, and it's also going to include fully painted miniatures of Dracula and the Hunters. Fury of Dracula will carry an MSRP of $59.99 when it hits stores in July. I've got to be honest, I have not played Fury of Dracula since I played the um, Games Workshop Edition. And that is from way long ago. I know uh, my best friend Elliot over at VoiceofE.com, huge fan of the um, Fury of Dracula, the, the edition that Fantasy Flight Games came out with. What I can tell from just kind of uh, taking a peek at what I've seen sort of floating around, I don't think there's a whole lot of changes from this edition to, I should say, with this fourth edition from the third edition, outside of like cosmetics, as far as, you know, bigger cards, fully painted minis, so on and so forth. I think the core gameplay has remained the same. All right, and my final news story, I wanted to share uh, an adventure that's available for Call of Cthulhu, which is from New Comet Games, and it seems pretty interesting because it's a sandbox adventure. So I've got the dope on the Star of the Shore. Ooh. The Star of the Shore is a Call of Cthulhu module for 7th edition, licensed by Chaosium. It can be run with 3 to 10 players. Very rarely you see a Call of Cthulhu adventure with that many players. And it can be utilized for experienced or beginning investigators. This is a sandbox-style adventure set in the classic 1920s era. A bizarre statue found in an old unearthed chapel has vanished. What are the true aims of the shadowy organization desperate to find this nameless relic? Most importantly, what dark secret rides at the heart of a small, picturesque town perched on the New England coast? The story is a blend of real history and fiction that gives the story a life of its own. 
The adventure is a result of two years of research, writing, and playtesting. The real history is fascinating and flows right into the Mythos world with very few changes. The more you discover, the deeper you're drawn towards your own insanity. In addition, the Star on the Shore comes with a second mini-adventure, Key to the Abyss, that can be run in one evening as a standalone or as a side mission for the Star on the Shore. As I mentioned before, it is designed for 6 to 10, 6 to 10, before it said 3 to 10. That changed up. Well, it's designed for up to 10 investigators and an experienced keeper. This adventure takes some work up front by the Keeper due to its sandbox style, but can become one of the best and most exciting adventures your group will ever have. Okay, that's from New Comet. It comes complete with handouts, maps, and pre-generated investigators. You can score the 99-page PDF right now at DriveThruRPG for $16.99. Seems a little pricey for a 99-page PDF, but it does seem pretty interesting. And of course, as always, I should point out, with Drive-Thru RPG, if you're planning on going and visiting, please stop by thegaminggang.com first, click on one of our banners. If you happen to make a purchase at Drive-Thru or any of the Drive-Thru sites, we'll get a small portion of that purchase and it goes a long way. All right, so that is the news for today. Pretty quickly through the news. Um, wish I could have found some, some additional uh, images for some of this stuff, especially that Waterloo Enemy Mistakes. What a bizarre name, but it could be kind of cool. Don't know, I have no idea. So uh, what is cooking this week? So I know you're, you know, most people are tuning in. They want to check out the Grimslinger's Northern Territory, or I should say the Northern Territory expansion review. And I'll get to that in just a few minutes. But did want to point out on tomorrow's show, it is War Game Wednesday. So I will be reviewing at any cost Mets 1870 from GMT Games, designed by my good buddy Herman Luckman. And of course, this is a Prussian, uh, Franco-Prussian war game. So that's going to be tomorrow. On Thursday, we're going to take a good deep dive into the core book for the Dark Eye. This is kind of a digest-sized rule book, and it still clocks in at about 400 pages. We're not going to look at all 400 pages, but I know there are some people out there who are very interested in checking out the English language version of the dark eye then on friday unfortunately i don't have it down here i should have brought it down i actually have a mario kart monopoly game that was sent to me so it is fridays tend to be like family fun fridays and i was going to take a look at the aventuria adventure card game i think the mario kart monopoly probably fits in for Family Fun Friday a little bit better than than the adventure card game. So we'll look at the adventure card game next week. Uh, next week, I also have a review of Thunderstone Quest coming from our friends over at AEG. Plus, uh, I should have my review for Of Dreams and Shadows, which is also from Rainbriar Games. All right, so I should point out forgot to once I jumped into the news there is chat available I know most people watch the uh, the Daily Dope after it aired live but usually there's a few people who are kind of catching it live so I do want to point out chat is available on YouTube it's not on screen kind of keep some of the trolls at bay but if you have a question or comments about the Northern Territory expansion or if you just want to say hello feel free to say hi I will definitely uh, chime in if you chime in. All right, so I should point out that the Grimslingers, or I should say Grimslingers, the Northern Territory, is from Greenbrier Games. It's designed, illustrated, and written by Stephen S. Gibson. So 
Mr. Gibson has taken on pretty much uh, all the work for the game. Do want to point out, you do need the core game to play the expansion. And the game is for two to four players if you're dueling and for one to four if you're playing the co-op campaign game. You can snag Grimslingers, the Northern Territory, for an MSRP of $29.95. All right, so let's pop on over to the other camera. Got a bunch of stuff all over the place. And I should point out a few different things. So I have already reviewed the original Grimslingers, which I got a bunch of stuff sitting in the box at the moment on the box top. But... There's the original Grimslingers. And I liked the game. I did enjoy the game. I gave it uh, an 8.1 out of 10. And one of the reasons why... I, and, and I mean, that's a good score. Don't get me wrong. I know some companies, they get upset when it's like, Oh, how did... Yo, we only got like a 7.5 out of 10. Well, 7.5 still means it's a good game. It just basically means that this is not, you know, earth-shattering. This isn't, you know, a lot of times games that have, are utilizing mechanics we've seen in umpteen other games aren't going to necessarily score like a 10. You know, well, hardly any games ever get a 10. Uh, but like, you know, a 9.5, something, you know, kind of rarefied. So an 8.1 meant I really liked the game. One thing I didn't like about the game was kind of the fiddliness of everything and just... Nothing seemed to be very intuitive, especially the rule book. The rule book was kind of a, I don't want to say a complete mess, but it wasn't really easy to decipher how to play the game. And most people had to resort to actually checking out videos from Steven Gibson to figure out how to play the game, which is never a good thing because you should be able to figure out a game based on the rule book itself. I mean, that's really how it should be. So, talking about the Northern Territory, I have to point out, let me get it. There we go. Okay, so here's the rule booklet. The rule booklet uh, clocks in about 30, well, 35 pages. But some of this is actually uh, dedicated to the campaign game, the Tall Tale game, right? So from page 23 on is pretty much talking about the campaign game, the kind of choose your own adventure sort of game, which I like. I do like it. I think I think it's pretty cool. I enjoyed the one from the first Grim Slingers. And this uh, kind of co-op game, you can play it solitaire too. Is, uh, is pretty good too. It's just very different than the original Grimslingers. So anyway, so back to my original <laughs> thought process. So we've got this rule book here. Now, from my understanding, this rule book is version 1.4. The rule book from the original Grimslingers right here is rule book 1.3. So, what the Northern Territory has done is it has changed up the way the core game plays. And I know people who liked Grimslingers originally may not necessarily dig these new changes to the game. Uh, and I'll tell you what, they're definitely not going to dig. They're not going to dig the complete mess that this 1.4 version fourth edition version, whatever you want to call it, uh, they are not going to dig the utter mess this rule book is. I, I've said it before that back in the day when I first started to play Greenbrier games, their, their rule books were kind of a mess. They were not intuitive. You had to dig around through them. Nothing ever seemed to be in the right place. Um, and then they got better, right? So they got better with the with vengeance and folklore. So they they really started to improve just the presentation and the flow of their rules. 
Unfortunately, with the Northern Territory, they have taken a huge step backwards. Now, I should point out, there is a 1.5 version rulebook that is available from the Greenbrier Games website that you can download, which is much clearer and clears up a lot of the typos and a lot of the information kind of being just not presented correctly. You, you kind of, you shouldn't have to be digging around through 20 some pages of rules to figure out how to play a card game, effectively a dueling card game. So got to point that out. Something else that I do want to mention too is there is an app for Grimslingers and it is available for PC, Mac, and I want to say Android. The problem there is, first of all, you shouldn't be required to download an app to be able to play a game, to be able to figure out how to play a game. Once again, that info should be in the rule book. Worst case scenario, a few frequently asked questions that are available on either the company's website or worst case scenario over on Board Game Geek, right? Well, that is not necessarily the case with Grimslingers or the Northern Territory expansion. Now, there were some how to play videos that Steven Gibson did for the original Grimslingers. And as I mentioned before, I had to watch those to kind of figure out how to play the game. Now, I have heard through the grapevine that Steven Gibson is not receiving royalties on Grimslingers or the Northern Territory. I, I don't I don't understand that. Uh, I mean, I don't know if there was just an upfront payment or if Mr. Gibson is just trying to establish this game world, because I do understand that um, that the rights to Grimslingers and the game and everything else are going to revert back to him in 2020. So the problem there is not making money off the game right now. I have to kind of give kudos to Mr. Gibson because he does go and answer questions on Board Game Geek about how to play and kind of point out some of the errors and, and so on and so forth in the rules uh, to help people get a better feel for how to play the game. That being said, I think because he's not actually making money on this right now, he's not all that gung-ho to be out there like shooting new video on how to play the Northern Territory expansion. And that's, you know, that's understandable. I mean, that really is understandable that you would not be sitting there shelling out, you know, shelling out a lot of your time and energy to, to kind of clarify how to play this game when you're not making any money off of it. That said, I have seen Mr. Gibson say, well, you know, the fault lies with the folks at Greenbrier Games. They didn't put together a good rule book, so on and so forth. I gotta say, there's probably blame to go around everywhere. Uh, I have run across plenty of designers out there who, uh, you know, they come up with ideas and they jot them down on a, on a napkin and, and hand it in and say, okay, there you go, figure that out, right? I'm not necessarily saying that's how Stephen Gibson is, but it does happen. So I, I think there's a little bit, you know, a little bit of blame to go <laughs> everywhere. There's plenty of blame to go around, I guess I would say. But once again, got to give kudos for Stephen Gibson for at least trying to answer people's questions. So I'm not going to go through all the gameplay of Grimslingers, the Northern Territory. I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about some of the changes. And some of the changes, uh, I don't know. I was kind of like, huh? Why did you go do this? Kind of scratching my head a little bit. So... What we have now, now, effectively, Grimslingers is kind of like a spell dueling game, right? So each of the players ends up getting one of these six, excuse me, element spells. So you've got fire, you've got ice, you've got earth, wind, water, lightning, okay? So everybody's going to get these. And these spells kind of work in a uh, rock, paper, scissors sort of way, right? So 
There are six different ones, but it breaks down into kind of three and three, right? So very rock, paper, scissors. Then there are, I want to say there's 24 kind of specialty spells that are in the original game. And I want to say there's two new ones that have been added for the Northern Territory. So each of the players, when, when you're playing a duo, you're going to get one of the specialty spells that only they'll be able to utilize in that duel, right? So that really hasn't changed. And then you've got, uh, you've got kind of a, a, a limit to how many cards you can have in your, effectively in your deck, right? But you can have stash cards that, so you could have more than eight cards. Uh, but the thing is, you need to actually swap out cards from your stash to put into your deck. Okay. All right. So effectively how the game works is if you're good, if you're playing one-on-one, -on -one, a one-on-one -on -one duel, it's pretty easy. You don't have to worry. You don't have to target other players, things like that. Now you can play kind of a free for all. You can play two on two. I know you could do like three on three. You could have up to six players in the, uh, in the original game, now in Northern Territory, they say, well, no, really, it only goes up to four. But then the rule book talks about three on three duels, which are kind of weird. And I'll tell you why. So anyway, so what you'll do is everybody's going to have a color. So for an example, I've got red. Red is my kind of sheet here. So you have these different target cards and you would actually select, say I was playing against three other people, somebody would have to select red as their target for them to actually attack me. Simple enough. With just one-on-one, -on -one, you don't worry about that because you're, you're going you know one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to worry about targeting a color. So some of the new stuff that's in this game as far as the, the expansion is now you've got this little mat that lays in front of you, right? And then you put your hit tracker here. So I've got Kipper, Kipper the dog. And don't ask me how a dog actually utilizes a sword. I, I have no clue. It's kind of funny. It's kind of cool. I love the artwork. I love the artwork in Grimslingers. And the game is actually, game is cool. It's just this new expansion. It's so much work to try to figure out how to actually play it right because things have changed. If the dueling was all the same and they just kind of changed the whole solo campaign, that'd be one thing. But they've kind of changed how the core duel works. And I know, you know Greenbrier says, well, we wanted to focus on stuff that people really enjoyed about it. Once again, I don't know if they pulled that off. So anyway, so you're going to have this health tracker, which is kind of cool. It's you know, a card that goes underneath. So you start off with 10 health. And as you lose hit points, you're just going to kind of move the card. It's going to kind of tell you, give you a little flavor text. So at six, it's tis but a scratch. So you just look at what's right below those two arrows, right? Pretty simple. Then you've got what's known as an anima. I believe that's how it's pronounced, which counts your EPs, your energy points. And I have to laugh because this is taken right from Gravity Falls. <laughs> this is the weird Illuminati character from Gravity Falls. I think that's hysterical. I wonder if Steven Gibson had something to do with Gravity Falls don't know. I know he's done a lot of uh, artwork for uh, rock album covers. So same kind of thing, right? We've got this little tracker here. So you got your EP and you just kind of change it up. Now, you'll also be able to flip over your anima as well to, to give you kind of like more power in that. So what you're, what you're basically doing is as you're playing is you're, you're kind of juggling, trying to keep your health and trying to restore your energy points because 
Most of the time when you're casting your spells, the spells cost you energy points. And some spells don't target your only your health, they may target your energy. Now, we also have these kind of like additional items. So this is the, the, the sword that the dogs got. So you've got a current durability on that too. So this is something kind of new. And there are, in the original Grimslingers, I want to say I, I could have swore there were eight Grimslingers. And now with the expansion, the Grimslingers themselves have changed. The characters haven't, right? So there's four characters in the expansion that are from the original game. But how they play has changed. And that's one of the reasons why I said, well, it really throws me off a bit where it's kind of like they're talking about a, a three on three duel. But the archetype cards are gone. There was a level level up mechanic in Grimslingers that I actually liked. I thought that was kind of cool. That's been tossed out. That's not around anymore. So really. Uh, and then, of course, now the Grimslingers have these skills. They've got these skill cards and they're, they've got eight and they can take four of them into a duel. You can choose four of them to utilize in your in the duel. They would actually go up here. But because space is kind of at a premium, I've got everything kind of shoved in here. Sorry. So anyway, so you would have these skills. They'd be up here. So then you've got this tells you exactly what you can do. So you've got the standoff phase. So it gives you you've got various different options that you can do. You can actually take something from the scavenge field. These are items that are available in the scavenge field. So you can get those items. Now, remember, you can only have eight cards. So as you're getting this stuff, you're going to be using your standoff phase to swap stuff in and out of your deck, right? Or, you know, your the available deck that you've got. So you've got an area for your stash, your discard pile, and your de deactivate pile. So once you once you use a spell, excuse me, on an opponent, it goes in your discard, and you actually have to spend EPs to be able to get cards back. So you can't just go through your go through your spells and be like, okay, well, all right, so I've used them all. I just take the deck back again. So what happens is there's because it, there's that whole rock, paper, scissors mechanic to it and your discards are face up. Everybody's going to know, especially like in a multiplayer duel, you know what cards have been discarded, right? So then that means the other player can kind of plan on what to use as a defense against what card gets played. So it's it's actually kind of cool. I mean, it, it's it's uh, in practice, it's actually much cooler than it sounds. And then uh, this here is actually a specialty spell that uh, I randomly got, right? So you get a random specialty skill spell, I should say, when you're playing in a regular duel. And you're just going to basically, you play until one of the characters, one of the players, depending on how many players you're playing in a duel, there's only one person left standing. So everybody else has been reduced to zero health. So uh, as far as this all goes, yeah, I mean, it's fine. I, yeah, they, there aren't though that big of changes that have been made in the duel itself. Granted, you've got the new skills that you can utilize. Yeah, and then you've got, you know, the item deck. Uh, a lot of people are having a hard time trying to figure out what cards come out of the item deck for just regular duels because you're going to use this item deck too in the Tall Tales. And uh, it's sort of like, well, like for an example, that, that shouldn't be in there. <laughs> Whoops. It's pretty simple. You just go through and it just says standard, right? Like these, these should not be in there. That's what kind of kind of throws folks off a little bit too is 
because the backing for all this stuff is the same, which it has to be. It's uh, uh, Some of the items should have blue. Uh, what do I have them? Ah, uh, they're floating around someplace. Some of them have little blue dots here, and uh, those are actually kind of gained from creatures when you're when you're playing in the campaign. So, as I was saying, uh, the dueling itself hasn't r radically changed. It's just now there are the skill cards. Uh, to me, it seems like there's there's a few more options as far as what you can do in the the standoff phase, and uh, that's pretty much about it. So, one thing that I I really dislike about this expansion is they've only done skills in that for four of the Grim Slingers from the original game. I guess they felt well, it's like the four most interesting Grim Slingers. They've revamped. It would have been nice if they had revamped all of the Grim Slingers. Yes, I understand it would have cost a little bit more. Probably would have boosted up the, the cost of the expansion. Because the expansion is, uh, I want to say it's $29.99, or tw uh, maybe $29.95. And that was actually the price of the original game. So, mm, kind of, sort of, eh, don't want the expansion to be more than... <laughs> In the original game, usually. So, but that is one thing that I was disappointed in, that they only kind of revamped four of the Grim Slingers from the original game, uh, which really, I mean, it's true. Whoops. Uh, it's true that the duels are two to four players because you've only got the, the four revised Grim Slingers but it is weird to see the rule book talk about three on three. All right, so the other super big problem I've got with the expansion has to do with the co-op mode. And the co-op mode changed up a little bit. I'm not gonna take a whole lot of the, the stuff out from the... Uh, where the heck is it? Where did it go? There's a lot of stuff all over the place. Whoops. Because, uh, yeah, because actually when you're playing, when you're playing this, you need quite a bit of room. All right, where'd the little map go? What happened to the little map? It's not in here. Uh, that's one of the other things you got to kind of be careful with is uh, not to accidentally mix up the stuff from... The first game uh, for the for the core game with the expansion, and that can be a little bit tricky. Now, of course, as I mentioned, you need the core game to utilize the expansion because you need all those spell cards. Because the spell cards don't come with the Northern Territory, you got to have the original game uh, and uh, stuff like uh, the anima and the. Uh, the character, the Grim Slinger card, and the trackers there. This is new. There's a bunch of new items, a bunch of new creatures. All right, so in the original Grim Slingers, the kind of campaign game, the kind of create your own adventure game, you were on a map and you were actually traveling around the map and you would run across creatures and you had a little adventure book and you would look up stuff and it was cool. I enjoyed it. Uh, I especially liked it because you could play it solitaire too. And as you went along, your Grim Slingers would level up. That was kind of cool, too. I like that. All right, so now that's all kind of changed. There's no map anymore. There's uh, the Fate deck, which is, which is effectively, it's just a regular deck of cards. And you'll actually go through and set up this deck to represent the area. I'll show you. So like so. So you're going to lay out all these different cards. So of course, just think. Take a look at the size of the cards now. Look at how much room that's going to occupy on your game table. And then, then you got to set this up. So you're going to set up all of that. <laughs> so all of a sudden, it be, it's like just this just big area. All these cards all over the place. 
Now, I do have to admit, I thought this was kind of cool. You get these achievement trackers and you get these progress trackers. So you can kind of follow along the campaign. And there's a campaign booklet right here. And there's an area booklet. I have to admit, this campaign is a lot longer than the original Grimslinger's campaign. So I dug that. I like that. Campaign's good. Uh, it is fun. There's new creatures in it. I love the artwork. It's like trippy, man. It's a little magic mushroom. Wow. <laughs> uh, I thought this was kind of bizarre. This is kind of a, it's like a minotaur, but it's nude. And if you notice, I, I have no idea why but it's kind of like pixelated. The groin is pixelated and it's kind of, it's like the uh, nude sour is what it's called. Weird, kind of, kind of bizarre, but I mean some really cool artwork on the baddies and that. So this is a wisp here. So definitely dug that. Definitely like the artwork. And of course, it's going to talk a little bit about these creatures and then the, then the creatures to make them different whenever you encounter different uh different ones you'll have creature modifiers so you're gonna, you're gonna have different creature modifiers talking about you know oh it, oh say for an example oh that magic mushroom's a mutant so you're gonna have that and you also have creature disposition so this is a little different too angry clever frisky prepared so that gives uh, a lot of additional replayability to the campaign because every time you run into uh let's say like a uh, mob of goblins there it's not going to be the same exact thing every time so i did like that too um all in all my problems with grimslingers the northern territory really stem from the lack of clarity in the rules, as well as the, the lack of availability to just find all the answers in one place. Uh, I, I honestly think that the 1.5 rule book that you can download clears some stuff up, but it doesn't clear everything up. And I'm really disappointed to see that this game came out with really so little, I guess, proofreading or just just going through to make sure that everything made sense in the first place, especially when the folks at Greenbrier Games knew that they were changing things up. Um, the other thing that bothers me is there's the app, and from my understanding, you can utilize the app to play the original campaign from the first, you know, from the core game with the new rules. And it, it, it kind of does the setup for you and everything else. Problem is, you shouldn't have to be, download an app to do that, right? I mean, that's how I look at it because, and, the, and I am not one of these people who are like, oh no, there shouldn't, there should never be an app in a game. No apps. And I know there are some folks out there, some gamers out there who are like, oh, they're abs absolutely against any sort of app with their tabletop games. I like apps when they kind of, uh, kind of add something to the gameplay. Maybe they provide, say, like a solitaire aspect to a game that's not designed to be solitaire. A uh, great example of some pretty cool apps would be uh, from Renegade Game Studios. They've got their app that adds all these different kind of aspects to Clank. And I think Fuse is another game. So those are pretty cool. What I don't like is when you need to have an app to be able to play a game. To me, that's not right. Especially when you don't have the app available for iOS. It's like, so if you have an Apple phone or iPad, or, you know, iPhone, whatever, you're not gonna be able to use the app. Now, granted, you can download it for your PC or Mac, but how many people want to drag their computer around with them to be able to play the game? 
So I personally thought that was uh, a big fail. I, I honestly thought that was a pretty big fail on the part of Greenbrier Games. So what does this all boil down to as far as what I think of the expansion? And should you pick it up? Is it worth picking up? All right, give me a second here. I'm gonna grab a sip, because my throat's getting a little dry. This is probably, and I, I gotta say, this is probably one of the, the more difficult reviews I've ever had to do. And there's quite a few different reasons for it. Um, because, like I said before, I liked the original game. I thought it was pretty cool. Now, if it was just the dueling aspect of the game, eh, it's it's fun, but it's it's not certainly not you know reinventing the wheel or anything like that. What I felt really sold the original Grim Slingers was the campaign and the co-op aspect of it. I thought, wow, this is really cool. This is a lot of fun. And, you know, you're dueling with the other creatures and the creatures have their abilities and stuff like that. It was, it was cool. I enjoyed it. That still goes with the Northern Territory. Cool aspect where, you know, you've got the, the co-op. You, you've got the much more to do, in my opinion, in this campaign than you did in the Grim Slingers campaign. So that's a plus. I like the creatures. I love the artwork throughout the entire game. My knock on the expansion is it's there's rule changes to how the dueling works. So if you figured out how to play the duel before, which it's it wasn't even that difficult to figure out. It's just once again, it was not a very well presented rule book to figure out some of the questions you're going to have. Uh so there are changes to the to the dueling and it's not very clear in fact one of the things that kind of threw me off is and it, it really doesn't have to do with dueling it has to do with just getting ready to to check out northern territory there's really nothing in there that says okay this is what you're going to use from the core game this is what you're not going to use basically they say okay well you're not going to use the the level tracker or the archetype archetype cards. That's not necessarily true. There's other stuff that you're not going to utilize from the core game when you're playing Northern Territory. So, like I said, big, big knock because nothing seems to be clear. And there, I guess, Greenbrier Games has been telling people that, hey, we're going to do some how to play videos. We're going to do, you know, we're going to have a PDF that makes everything clear. And we're going to have a PDF so you can play the original campaign with the new rules. And nothing. It's not out there. So, like I said, I'm not one of these people who enjoys having to go look up FAQs. And there really isn't like a, a an FAQ available either. It's just you got to kind of search around Board Game Geek for questions that uh, people are asking or you've asked and Steven Gibson has gotten around to answering. So that's a big knock. Uh, other knock is the app aspect where if you've got the app, everything becomes so much clearer. If you don't have the app, everything's pretty muddy figuring out how to play and as far as even doing the, uh, the co-op campaign. The app makes that a lot easier too. So, like I said, I'm not a big fan on having a game where you don't assume you're going to need an app to play it. And then after the fact, you find out, well, yeah, you need to have this app. So, but does that mean that this is bad? No, it's actually pretty good once you spend enough time figuring it out. That's where the real problem comes down is is it worth your time to have to sit there and stumble across everything and figure things out? Even with the new, I believe, fifth version of the rules not being as clear as they should be. All depends on what you thought about the first game. If you really dug Grimslingers and you really dig the game world and the kind of 
kind of oddball aspect of it and you like the whole, you know, uh, cooperating with your friends as grim slingers as you're going through this campaign, yes, it should be worth the effort to figure out how to play this new expansion, how to incorporate it. If the first Grim Slingers was sort of like, yeah, you thought it was all right, eh, it's okay. I don't really see the expansion making it, even like the core dueling, so much better that you need to get this expansion. So if you were somebody who was kind of like, eh, overall with Grim Slingers, now I can't really recommend you picking this up. So it all boils down to, if I were to give this a score on a, let's say, 1 to 10, taking everything into account, I could recommend Grimslingers the Northern Territory, but I can't say it's a really solid recommendation. So I would give it like a 6.5 out of 10. If they ever iron out some of these weird discrepancies and things like that, because there are still typos in even the updated stuff, online, if they ever iron all that stuff out, I would probably give it about an 8. It should be around an 8. It's about, I liked it about as well as I did the original game. Like some of the changes, don't like other changes, but it's still a pretty good game. As I mentioned, it's really up to you if it's going to be worth a lot of the effort it's going to take for you to figure it out. Especially if you're looking at Grimslingers now and you pick up the core game and the expansion together, you got a lot of head scratching ahead of you. <laughs> so, sorry to say, it is worth it. I enjoy the game, but to each their own, right? Like I said, this is one of the more difficult reviews I've had to put together because at its core, it's still pretty cool. It's just figuring out how that core works can be a little tricky. All right, so... That's it for today's show. As I mentioned earlier, tomorrow is War Game Wednesday, so tune in as I review at any cost Mets 1870 from GMT Games. And when you're not watching The Daily Dope, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. I will be back tomorrow. So until then, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, and thanks so much for watching.